Good morning, how are we? Good. If all the children that are going to be at the child care can head on to the back, I appreciate y'all. Look at y'all experience. Just staying standing. Y'all know what's about to happen. All right. Um, open up your Bibles to James chapter 1. We're going to look in at verses 19 to 25 this morning. And I'm going to read it in our hearing. Okay, it's a plane outside. Um, verse 19 says, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once regrets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you because you have gifted us with this day that we as your children can gather as brothers and sisters in Christ to make much of you, to sing your word and to hear your word preached. I pray, Lord, that you would still all the distractions. You would focus us on the preached and proclaimed word of God, and it will be like a seed deeply planted in fertile soil and will bear much fruit in the week to come and in the rest of our lives. We love you, Lord. We thank you for everybody that is here, those who are watching online and for our Brothers and sisters in Christ, you can't be with us today, that you would give them safe travels and keep us all safe. We ask all of this in your name. <coughs> Excuse me. Amen. You may be seated. All right. So the title of my passage this morning is very simple. It is a Christian that does. Now, the passage I'm reading is one that I'm sure many of you are aware of. Be, here, be not only hearers of the word, but doers also. But in a hope to encourage and also just to put a little bit of a refresher, what I really want to just discuss is two main things. The, pre the prerequisites for doing as Christ has called us, but then also a case for why doing is so important and absolutely necessary. So let's look at the first two verses, or verses 19 to 21. Verse 19 says this, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak. And slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. You see, when we hear about James and we think of him as a writer, we all know him for one thing. Those who are familiar with the scriptures know how controversial he seems to be understood. Someone who, you know, when you had Paul coming over here with Galatians, making it so clear, how dare you think that by your works you can earn the salvation or pleasure or happiness of God. And then on the contrary, it seems James shows up and says, no, 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 no. Look, let me tell you something. Your works matter. Okay. Like your works play a significant part to you bearing testimony to the fact that you have been saved by Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. And so for many, there seems to be this contradiction. And these verses serve as the summary or the headline of the contradiction that we see in James. James is all about what you do. And he very much is. But even before we get to the famous verses of not only hearers, but doers only, he seems to, to set the stage for the kind of doing that he's talking about. And the, set, the stage that he's setting is one that emphasizes what is going on within yourself spiritually and personally. Some would argue that James is overly concerned about how you relate to other people. Maybe he is, but it's because the whole Bible is concerned about how you relate to other people too. But first of all, he understands that you cannot give what the Lord is not already at first working within your own soul. And it's interesting as to how he starts. He starts by number one, being slow to speak and being slow to anger. He seems to suggest in those verses that there is somewhat a relationship or correlation with how quick you are to get your words out and how emotionally unstable you are. Hmm. 
Maybe if you're quick to speak, you know, you like to hear the sound of your own voice and you think everybody else needs to too. There might be a connection between your quick words and your quick anger or quick frustration. Maybe being slow to speak somehow influences or says a lot about how you respond emotionally to the situations you find yourself in. Maybe in a world where everybody's eager to say something and to be heard, but very hesitant to listening to what other people might have to say, this is an important tip or instruction that we should consider. What if the way to truly living on witness for the kingdom that we so profess to be from is not by letting everybody know what we have to say so clearly, or better said, not just by doing that, but first of all, being a people that are quick to listen. Maybe before we are quick to bamboozle people with our theological opinions and doctrine, we can take a second to hear where they're coming from first. Maybe it's more in the listening of people and their challenges we find ways to, to bless them and to help them through it than it is in articulating so well and fluently in a bunch of five or 50 different languages what it is that we believe. Maybe the biggest gift that we as a church can give our community is not how much we know, but how well we listen and how well we empathize. And maybe one of the biggest things that can heal our conflicts in our homes, marriages, and relationships is being quicker to listen and slower to give our damning judgment on the situation. If there's anything my few years of marriage has taught me is if I feel a certain way, it is best to give it a few hours to see if I still feel a certain way before I open that mouth of mine. I have learned many a times that even when there is much challenge or discussion and arguments to be made, that it's probably best I write down everything that my emotions is feeling and don't I dare send that thing. I better sleep on it for a little bit, think about it, and then see if I want to send that same message the way that I had initially written it. And what I tend to find out is, you know, I'll, I'll, I probably shouldn't say that first sentence like that. And No, Daniel, that's not true. That's rude. And there's a difference. You might want to change that a little bit. And then what turned out to be a 2,000-word essay ends up becoming a 100-word essay, if you will, of love, grace, and truth, too. Have you ever thought about that in your own lives? I think in our specific culture of Christendom, we value information. And the Bible does too. We value learning and understanding what scripture says about particular situations and issues. But sometimes our biggest challenge is not just the information, but what we do with it after we've acquired it. And we think what we should do with it is let everybody know what we have learned. When again, and I'm reiterating it again because I know it's a struggle we all have, the first decision might be to ask and to listen first. But James makes it clear that he cares about personal holiness, not only in the fact that we should be slow to speak and therefore slow to anger, but he correlates that with holiness. In verse 21, he makes it clear, just like clothes that you put on and you put off, he says, therefore, put away, that put away phrase can be take off, take off all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls." I want us to notice what he poses as the solution or the next step after you put off sin. For someone who is so famous for being all about doing, 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 James, again, seems to understand the importance of learning and hearing too. Yes, we're going to get to the verses where he says, don't only be a hearer, be a doer. But right now he's saying, put away sinfulness, but also receive with meekness the implanted word of God. So James understands it is important that we are properly discipled and faithfully fed a good understanding of the scriptures. It seems with him there is this clear understanding understanding, I wonder where he gets it from, that true understanding of scripture will affect us and enable us to live faithfully outdoors. You cannot be a proper Christian witness with all your goody good two-shoes deeds if you are not ensuring that that is coming from a right understanding of who God is, his gospel, and how he applies in our lives personally, but corporately as a people. We need both of them. We need to be well-learned in the scripture, well-taught and well-equipped, but well and thoroughly versed in practicing our faith outside of these four walls and a few garage doors. 
We must be hearers. But note what he says with meekness. That is with meekness receiving the implanted word. What does it mean to meekly receive God's word? It means to show up every day when you are sitting under someone you trust as a faithful preacher and teacher of God's word, ready to hear something that might irk you a little bit because of your sinful nature, but defer to the faithful teaching of God's word and say, I'm going to go with that even though my flesh irks with it a little bit. It means showing up when God's word is being taught, ready and eager to listen and hear and apply. And none of us are exempt from that. There can be this temptation that on Sundays I don't preach, I can just sit down here and let Jared do his thing, Jason do his thing, or Chad do his thing, and we're like, all right, get it on, get it over and done with, and then I'm going to preach next week. No, no, no. When I come here and I'm not preaching, I strive to be like all of us should be, eager and ready to have my pastor, Jared, my pastor, one of the elders, preach God's word and wash me with his truth so that I can take it home and apply it. We all should come before the faithful preaching of God's word with a level of humility that says, I'm going to learn something today and I'm going to take it and apply it in my life. How do we approach not only the preached word of God, but the written word of God? Not only when it's read from the Bible in our quiet times, not only when we hear it on a podcast or we hear it preached today, but when it's shared by a brother or sister in small group, or in regular life, over a cup of coffee or a meal, or shared by your child, right after you just finished correcting that little kid, and they share the word of God. How do we respond? Do we receive it meekly? Because I believe all these verses, verses 19 to 21, are all connected. I think that there's a connection between being slow to speak and slow to anger, and receiving the word with meekness. I think in one sense, receiving the word with meekness empowers us to be more and more slow to anger and more and more slow to speak. The more and more we posture our hearts to be a listening people who realize we do not know it all and we will never know it all. And that the true definition of maturity in Christ is the fact that we are always seeking to learn from other people. When we understand that, of course, the byproduct of that is that we're slower to speak and that we're slower to anger. So make no mistake, James doesn't have this all separate and unrelated. They are all connected. Slow to speak, slow to anger means someone who is also humble and ready to hear the word of God. But now James transitions and he makes a case for why it is impossible, important for us as Christians to be a doing people. Look at verse 22 with me. James says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, then he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. It is the practice of what we believe that really impacts our personal lives, our relationships, and those that we encounter. The analogy that James uses there is very similar to something that I'm sure happens to all of you. Have you ever been in your house at a certain point and you're like, I need to go do this in the bedroom? So with a few distractions, you make yourself to the bedroom. Once you're at the bedroom, at that wonderful moment, you forget why you went upstairs to the bedroom. Right? Am I the only one that's happened to? No? Okay. There's a lot of others, right? And what it is, is that no matter how much you know what you're trying to go and do, if you don't make constant practice of those things that you know, it will not show up when you most need it. Most security experts will tell you that at the time of emergency where you don't have a time to consider what you need to do, you will resort to your worst level of reasoning and physical capabilities. So for example, someone would think, you know, when the adrenaline's pumping in my body, I who've never run a day in my life, when I need to, I'm gonna go running. I'm gonna run away from that danger. Most scientists believe that that's not actually the case. What you will do is stay stunned because of the danger that is incoming. And in a similar vein, By practicing God's truth and the theology that we strive to hear regularly, we begin to make a habit of how we respond in particular situations unconsciously. 
So therefore, it is always a good assignment after you hear a message, after you've listened or discussed God's word with another person or in the context of a small group, to find practical ways to apply things you've learned. Have you ever done that before? Maybe you've heard a message that has been very important about reminding yourself of your identity in Christ and the gospel. And so after you heard the message, you get a sticky note and you, you put a verse, John 3.16, if you will, and you put it on your dashboard. Some people might say that's a little bit eccentric. Some people might say you're such a teacher's pet. But that small steps of faith and achieving and trying to implement the things we learn from Scripture equip us to when the hard things really get going in life, to resort to what? Our most basic level of trust and understanding of faith in God's word. So it's making the habit of applying God's word when you have the time and the comfortability to do it that will empower you when things are going hard and you're resorting to what comes quickly to stand strong and to, retor- and to resort to the things above and not the things of this world. When I was younger in my faith, I was, you know, hungry, devouring the scriptures and learning. But before I was saved, I had a problem. I, my father was an alcoholic. Most of the people where I came from were alcoholics too. And so when the going gets tough, Daniel Seshi would drink a little too much, okay? Now, I was saved. I, I loved the Lord. I was studying the scriptures. I was devouring. I knew theology, if you asked. But if I was honest, I was so focused on learning and rarely ever trying to implement what I had learned. I thought I had arrived because I knew a lot. I had heard a lot. But if you really asked me about my practice, my practice was so limited. You want to know why it was so limited? Because when I had opportunities to do, I was still focusing on hearing, not valuing that true hearing leads to what? Faithful doing. And so when the heat started rising in my life, and the stress and bad things started coming my way, I resorted to what I knew best. I resorted to what I had practiced the most. And though I'd heard a lot of God's word, I wasn't practicing a lot of his word. And though I'd heard about people who drink, I sure was practicing a whole lot of that. So when the heat went up, y'all know what I resorted to. An old habit showed up. I really do believe that part of our spiritual journey and our journey of sanctification is who are we feeding? What are we feeding in our lives? Are we feeding the spirit, Christ's spirit in us, or are we feeding our flesh? Are we indulging more and more in these sinful habits more and more than we are indulging in feeding and equipping our spirit? Yes, by hearing God's word and his word preached, but also practicing it. Because the more of what we feed will manifest itself more strongly in the day-to-day lives. You might have certain struggles, things you're probably not too confident or comfortable sharing with other people, but I'll tell you about those struggles. The more and more you feed those struggles, the more and more you'll resort to those struggles when the going gets tough. The more and more you feed your spirit with God's word, the more and more you will resort to God's word when the going gets tough. God has called us to be a doing people, people. And what are ways that we are taking all that we are learning from the scriptures and applying it in our lives? As I prepare to close, it's a regular shorter message. Some of y'all are short. Since it's Labor Day, I figured I'd bless y'all. As I prepare to close, one of the things I thought about as we started this journey in James is how interesting James is. If you're in my small group, you heard me say this. So you can just you know, re-listen again. But James is very much a Jewish Christian. And what I mean by that is, yes, he is a believer. He believes in Jesus. But the story of James is that he is through and through a Jewish guy. In fact, he was a faithful follower. He's known for it. And we see in the book of Acts, he was one of the people that made that final decision to to chill or to reduce some of the expectations and demands they had on people who weren't Jewish and became Christians being accepted into the church. He is someone, when you read the book of James, makes it very clear that he believes the gospel is for all people, but he has a particular calling to people who are biologically from the house of Israel. And so when you see that, you can begin to ask yourself this question. What do you do with an individual who is called to a specific people, 
to a specific cause. We have many a people like that in our church. A good example with someone like Jason Williams. Someone, yes, who believes in the preaching and teaching of the gospel and loving of all people, but he has felt led to practice his Christianity in a way that targets at-risk youth and at-risk adults too, but just in a different way. And I want to challenge you in this church that many of you like James and so many other people in the Bible will have a deep-rooted calling to a particular group of people whether it's the singles, whether it's the women, whether it's people of a certain ethnicity, whether it's those who are incarcerated, whether it's those who need to be adopted or fostered. And what can tend to happen in the church and in our culture is that with that passion and with that calling, there can be a selfish self-righteousness that develops. And what I mean by that is that if you are not about adoption of people in the 1040 window, you are not truly a believer. If you are not all in all out advocating for the women who are being mistreated in the ways that I am, then you're not really about what Christianity calls you. And as a result, there will be discourse. There will even be disagreement within the body of Christ because there are those that feel very heavily convicted about particular issues. And what I want to remind us this morning as I'm studying and as you're reading through James, because you'll see it with him, when he begins in verse 1 to 5, he makes it very clear the believer is in dispersion because specifically he's writing to other Jews who at that point had been chased out of Jerusalem and were exiles in different lands. And so he does have this particular people that he is reaching out to. And it affects his personality in certain ways. Like I'm sure although he admitted and was okay with the Gentile Christians becoming proper Christians, if he showed up where you know, there were Jews and Gentiles and the Gentiles weren't washing their hands like the Jews, I'm sure it irked him just a little bit. Like, ah, ooh. Because there were manifestations of the culture that he came from and the burden that he had that was still there. I mean, he's on this side of eternity. Where am I getting at with all of this? Number one, pray about what the Lord is laying on your heart who the Lord is calling you to reach out to, who the Lord is calling you to place a unique and specific burden to minister and to advocate for. Number two, realize that there are going to be people in this church that might disagree with what exactly that looks like. And that's great. That's great. It's perfect because in the church, we need healthy accountability. And it's in the accountability of people that might have a different application of the same truth that we find the truth and we can stay in good health. But number three, I think that's number three. I can't remember the number. Maybe it's number four. Okay, one of them, right? We as a body are called to do. And so begin to think about ways that we can build and leverage our influence in our workplace and within our families to maybe take our eyes from within ourselves and within this building and to look out, to look out, to see those who are in need and ways that we as a church can meet it. We as a church want to empower and mobilize our members to be faithful witnesses in their communities. So if there's something the Lord has laid on your heart, please let the leadership know. That's something that we want to pray about and find a way to encourage and affirm. But most importantly, if there's anything I want you to take from today, it's this. God has not called us only to be great hearers of God's word, to learn the Greek and the Hebrew, to parse, break down, translate. He has called us to take that knowledge and apply it in our daily lives. That is how we show ourselves to be truly impacted by the great, powerful, and finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. If you will, will you bag your heads and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift that it is, that it calls us to greater faithfulness in you and obedience. But yes, Lord, the fact that it thinks about the whole of us. Lord, regularly when we go through books like James, I am astounded and humbling, humbled at the fact that you are a God that uses every ounce of us to communicate your truth to us perfectly. You used the sentiments of James the burden he has for Jewish Christians in how he writes and how it can inspire us to be a people that can feel called to specific areas and needs that we see in our existence as we live in Birmingham and live in this world daily. Help us to be a people that seek to receive your word with humility and meekness, but also are eager to apply it, to impact and to use it to impact people's lives. Give us the grace to live well and live together in Christ and in community with one another. 
But I pray, Lord, it will not stop there. It will continue to impact our community and the world. We love you, Lord. We ask all this in your name. Amen.